Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another goddamn edition of Deep Fat Fry. Goddamn motherfucking edition. God, the best damn. son of a bitchin' cock sucking show on the goddamn motherfucking twat licking bitch smacking planet. Uh, fat deep. Fat you know what I'm saying, fried. you motherfuckers. The uh, fucking best show that deep. ever fucking existed in the fucking history of fucking planet fucking Earth. It's it's uh I'll it's, uh, it's, enough, uh, it's uh it's a uh, it's a uh, 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 in the, the universe fried, uh, in the universe the sweet fried fritter deep fried I'm just coming on in right on did you catch Biden I just deep fried 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 Scory, I Dude, believe, was one Pole's of them. Ego. TJ and caught I think Pole's it was, uh, ego. Uh, James, James T. TJ caught COVID-78, dude. Hey, you got to be there. He and caught COVID. He caught the COVID. And listen. The co-Biden. Oh, listen, shit, he's got the bio. You're a dog-faced lion pony dog soldier. You get out of here. That's true. With your malarkey. Oh, my God. Dude. That's a lot of malarkey, boy. Do you, do you understand how insufferable TJ is going to be as an old man? Uh, Can you even fucking that's imagine? That's a lot of fucking malarkey, what do you mean? boy. He's, like then. He, <laughs> well, I'm now? just saying. Like, You're full of shit. For, for every bit as insufferable as he is now, think about when TJ literally just loses his mind and he's just babbling. Oh, my God. Hey, you fucking goddamn dog-faced lion pony Scotty, soldier. we've got to build a windmill now. Scotty's going to be the aggressive old <laughs> man. Scotty's going to be like, that's constantly yeah, 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 yeah. chasing people off his lawn and... Get out of here, you uh, piece of shit! Talking about how back in his day, he, the drones, if, if he was 20 years younger, he'd whoop your fucking ass. Drone comes to deliver a package. He's out there with a baseball bat. Hitting <laughs> it. God damn me, fucking b- bussard trash! <laughs> <laughs> Did I hope I'm that cool? Fighting with his appliances, <laughs> like your dad used to do. Remember that shit? You told me about that? Yeah. This fucking toaster! <laughs> Why it burned my toast again? Die! God damn piece of fucking shit! When I was 15, toasters was made right. Toasted your bread each time, both sides, not a problem. You don't even put butter on it for you, too. We've regressed. I'm going to be the, technology. Uh, I'm gonna be the sad old man in a home laying with a blanket across his lap, looking out a window <laughs> and re- wistfully remembering the good old days, you know? That'll be me. Well, that's oh. you now. I know. That's why I know. That's why. That's how I know that I'm going to be that old man. I, I can already yeah. see it's already happening. But he's saying, you know, with the, what he can't take care of himself when he's in there. Like, here you go, peaches. Have some applesauce. Someone rolled me closer to the window so yeah. I could see outside. Some somebody's going to keep bringing me chamomile tea and shit because I can't. You know, I can no longer express that I don't like tea. You know what I mean? So I have some tea, Grandpa. He always he always takes a sip or two of it, so we just give him chamomile tea. We figure that's what he likes. You know. I hate this. I can't even. I, I'm I, I'm lo- I'm so lost. I can't even do that. <laughs> I can't even be like I don't like tea. I can't form that anymore. I'm just you know. Thanks. My life is just a blur <laughs> of fantasy. <laughs> tea. That's gonna be <clears throat> awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to those days. Well, I guess no one like it's a happy ending, do they, Paul? <laughs> I I consider that a happy you ending. You get it in a massage oh, parlor yep. or two. That's usually. that's a happy ending in my usually world. Usually the Asian ones. Well, that's like a really sad ending is like you die looking at your own guts because some somebody blew you up in a Walmart or something. <laughs> it's like damn. Oh fuck! Oh, I died in a Walmart. Why? Ugh. That's the most patriotic place to die, though, when you think about it. Yeah. You die inside a fucking Walmart, a store filled with shit made in third world countries that you're buying for cheap. That's a sad indictment of the United States. (laughs) God bless this country. This is a great damn country. If you're going to die somewhere, die in a Walmart. (laughs) If you're going to die, do it in Walmart. That's that's part of my no Walmart policy. And number one on the list is... You don't go to Walmart, you can't die in Walmart. I can't die in a mass shooting in a Walmart. I'm excited. I refuse to go to one. Yeah. So I'm good. Scotty's legit. So this show tonight is um, like one of, one of the things that interests me most. This is like one of the things that I find to be the most interesting big dicks. <laughs> that's well, that's I got that one in the works, too. 
No, didn't we already do a big dicks show? No. no. Oh, that's right. You were gonna do one. I was gonna Chelsea, do it. But you, uh, could, you couldn't take the wide load. Yeah. Chelsea cocked him, dude. Could, TJ couldn't take that dick, dude. Couldn't take it. Too big. Got to do it on vaginas. Dick too big. <laughs> Got to do it on vagina, TJ. But uh, no, this is this is the type of shit like the the. The care and the energy and the fervor that I see people pour into like modern politics, especially people that follow like the day to day politic bullshit. Yeah, this is where us I ha- us helpless and hapless political junkies. Yeah, what what little bit of that energy I have, I long ago decided wasn't I wasn't going to dedicate that fucking shit to politics anymore. So this is what I do. When my mind wanders, this is the type of shit I like to think about, and I like to think about different paths to it. So we're going to talk about some... We've done a show about the end of the world. As we know it. Like, uh, all the different ways that we likely will meet our horrible and tragic end. But we've never done a show on possible futures for humanity. Let's set aside the presumption that a super volcano is going to blow up and kill us all, or an asteroid is going to come out of nowhere and kill us all. And let's... Talk a little bit about the possibilities ah. of humanity. What, which paths could we take? The different paths that humanity could take in the distant and super distant futures. Yeah. That's what I like to think about. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Cool. I like it. Uh, the first option that I want to put up for discussion is the status quo, which basically presumes that we're not going to see this giant and radical shift that we will figure out somehow to make, you know, how to make our modern way of life sustainable. Technology may change around us, but the fundamental way that we interact with our government and our day-to-day lives is not going to change. All I always felt like um, when people made movies or wrote books or about the future, usually um, it was an exaggeration of people's, usually criticisms of the present. Like, you know, they just assume that every trend that they identify in the present world that they live in is going to continue on forever in perpetuity, evolving and changing. And not only that, but it's a huge way that they look at human beings. So imagining a human being that doesn't share that perspective is almost impossible to people. Right. Because it's so rooted in what they know and how they were raised and what they were raised around. So, like, you know, somebody who's uh, hyper-concerned about, you know, commercialism and stuff is probably going to imagine a future where commercialism has gotten even worse and everything's an advertisement and everything is just, you know, about that. If someone thinks, like, oh, we live in a degenerate time, they're probably going to make the future even more degenerate and you know uh you know whatever it's usually a matter of like whatever criticisms i have of the present are just going to get in infinitely worse in the future uh because it's like they they want to show you this this dystopian future as a cautionary tale like if we don't change our ways now we're heading towards they're, they're this projecting basically. That their own anxiety and fear right, right. into the future yeah. right and that's kind of tends to be how most people write the future now there's exceptions to that and stuff but um but I, I think that this status quo future is kind of just the the embodiment of that, right? Where it's just like you take the present and you just look at the trends that you see in the here and now and say, what if that just continued on? Maybe not in perpetuity, well, it, but for a long time. It's it's basically and what would that future look like? It's basically in the preface of what you're talking about because what you like when we said it, it's like we have to continue on in this path. So because I mean, usually these cataclysmic changes. It's like the fall of Western civilization, like the Roman Empire has fallen or something. Like you need this big event. So to, to assume that, you know, this is going to happen, we have to assume that we somehow can make all this stuff work. So just discussing the status quo is almost astonishing because we have, I mean, at, at that point, if it's 100 years now and we're still living the way we're living, there must have been some amazing technological developments or something that was like, oh, we were wrong and we were able to reverse climate change or we're suddenly able to just create way more food. Now, the status quo possible future doesn't eliminate the possibility of some big changes in the power structure. Like this could happen and China could take over the world. Right. Or be the dominant force in the world. Right. Yeah. This could happen and China could collapse like the Soviet Soviet Union. Union. Yeah. And there could be a new United States ascendancy in the world. So you're not necessarily precluding 
the possibility of some major world events shaking things up a little bit. Right. What but, I'm talking about is is what fundamentally doesn't change is how citizens interact with their government and okay. this and the and the basic quality of life that Remains we're able to provide. Roughly the same. That remains roughly the same. Little, you know, government big power shifts might happen on the government stage, but when it comes to how the clients interact with the fucking, you know, society at large, that remains the same. So what do you see when you think about that? Because we're all probably going to have different interpretations of what that well, means. Well, another thing that this doesn't, this hypothesis doesn't eliminate is how, whether or not it comes to like a revolution or not. How do people feel about the status quo being the only available way of living their lives? Are they contented with it? And so pacified from any kind of violent uprising? Because would, they want to preserve it. I mean, if we're talking about the true status quo, I think that you have a massive amount of discontent that's either being redirected or uh, distracted away from, or, you know, there's these illusory mechanisms whereby things could change, but you actually try to pursue them and they just lead to these like tragic uh, dead ends. Right. That totally sap there's, the but, enthusiasm out of people. But that next generation always has its hopeful right. moment, right? So and it's they like, always think, like, we're going to be the ones to turn it around. We're going to be the one, like, you know, every generation's got, like, it's like, oh, I'm this trans, I'm this transformative figure or this transformative movement right. that's going to change things. But that's gonna behind fix the, the status scenes, quo, but it doesn't. Right. The status quo remains the same. Some little token legislations get passed, some little token social issues get dealt with. But the economic reality remains the same. The power structure of the world remains the same. And the the question I think when you talk about possible futures like this is which way is the wind going to blow with people? Are we going to become more docile or more captive to this cyclical generational we're the change people. And then it never happens. And Oh God, no, I'm, but I'm old and I'm dying now. So it doesn't really matter because the new, generation you know do we become aware of that well change is like a nebulous concept that people get behind but if you actually sit down and talk to people like well what should change that's when the disagreement starts right you know so it's very difficult to say i mean like people agree in these big ideas but the actual the actual energy and force of will it takes to make those ideas go from a vision to a reality is so difficult so the the question as i see it then is do we become aware of the, uh, as Scotty put it, this big idea that we're all laboring and having disillusions under, uh, or do we just become more pacified generation to generation and more accepting of, well, you know, change. Tr- we tried. I think it's <laughs> we gave it a shot. I think that you'll continue to see. I think it, you know we'll basically be pacified with incrementalism. I think you'll see little concessions made, but for every concession that's made, they're going to fucking figure out some other thing to take. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to give you, uh, okay, you want, you guys have been fighting for uh, universal health care for a while, so we're going to give you that, but we're going to take even more civil liberties and we're going to spy on you even more and we're just going to put cameras in your house and we're going to chip you and we're going to do all this other stuff. The question, the question I have, though, because to me, that kind of lifestyle is fundamentally disgusting to right. think about. Yeah, exactly. But look at the current fucking generation. Right. And I'm not trying to be a boomer here, but they boomer. are and they are absolutely enraptured by their technological devices. Right. They like to the a lot of them seek to live very publicly. They put their every yes. thought, their every vacation picture out there for the world, presumably, if they could have that kind of audience to see. Right. So they're I in my mind, they're naturally gonna be more accepting to that trade off. Right. Less civil liberties, less privacy. Because what's fucking privacy? Who wants to be alone? I'm scared. Privacy is dead. And I mean, and and the greatest fucking, the greatest trick that was pulled with all this stuff was that people for years were like, the government's going to come in and force you. You're going to fucking be forced to do it. But just make a fucking wonderful. Yeah, but make a wonderful device like a smartphone and people just give it away. Because most people don't even fuck. Like, look, if you read Edward Snowden's book, which I encourage everyone to fucking do, like, or, or if you don't want to just trust him, like, there's so many sources online. Like, look at how the, the bulk data collection, look at all this stuff, and people are willingly doing it. And it's going to get to the point where it's not even going to be optional. Like, they're going to make everything, like, oh, there's an app for that. Oh, you have to use the app. Oh, you have to connect this way. And that means you're going to have to have one of these devices. Ergo, you're going to be tracked. It's inevitable. So another wing of this status quo before we move on 
is the idea that we should structure society to beat it. So not just give over to it, not necessarily a violent revolution, but a restructuring of society in order to beat it. And a lot of those people are, they think that the key to doing that is to uh, reduce technology, to literally start getting rid of some of the technologies that we have come to rely on in our day-to-day lives. And, and this absolutely, is a, this is Paul's buddy here. Yeah, my, my good friend, Ted, Teddy boy over here. We used to call him Teddy boy mm-hmm. back in the day. Good old Teddy boy. Um, He's a teddy bear. Uh, the name for people that think like this is Neo-Luddite. So a Luddite is a person that kind of eschews technology or poo-poos modern technology. Um, and uh, in some extreme cases uh, advocates for getting getting rid of them. But th- it's kind of an old idea. And, and these in, are and in some even more extreme cases, sends bombs to people with right. the intent of somehow prompting that change to happen. So this is, yeah, this is kind of the modern era's version of being a Luddite. Um, and Ted Kaczynski was very, very specific about the what... the Unabomber we're talking about. Yeah, the in Unabomber. Anyone, in case anyone is confused. Right. Um, the Unabomber, of course. I'm going to read... Uh, a little bit from his manifesto here. Okay. Uh, It starts with the premise that the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. So he kind of sees it happening right around industrialization and everything that he saw that was horrible in society was just an outcropping from that. Yeah. This is him standing next to his uh, little cabin. He moved, uh, uh, he he was a, a professor. Yeah. At one point in California. And he just kind of all of the sudden moved to the middle of nowhere in Montana in this little kind of shack, lived a very utilitarian existence. Right. And he even said that this uh, this this little uh, cabin was not even this was not isolated enough for for his taste. Right. Which is, you know, why why he turned violent, honestly, is because he realized once he got up to Montana that he was still so dependent on the structure as it existed. And he was still so close to all this bullshit. You know, he had, he still had neighbors that would totter by and he still had, you know what I mean? He couldn't, he couldn't get away from the system that he hated. And so that turned him to this kind of violent revolutionary type of thinking where he started mailing these bombs off to intellectuals that were advocating for different things and wrote this uh, huge manifesto. Um, He says that the continued development of technology will worsen the situation and advance towards its logical conclusion, which is complete control over everything on earth, including human beings and all other important organisms. Now, a lot of people would hear that and go, "Eh, what a crazy fuck. But is that not what's slowly but surely happening? I mean, we talked about it during our status quo segment about how people are becoming ever more tolerant of constant surveillance Is that not a move in the direction that Ted Kaczynski is talking about here? Literally taking control of the populace, controlling what you can say, what you can wear, where you can be, knowing where you are at every fucking second of every fucking day, knowing who you talk to and what the contents of that conversation were. That's what he's talking about. And it's already happened. Yeah, there's just a huge amount of, um, amount of data on every person. It's like, you know, hey, what are uh, Paul's sexual proclivities? What does he think about this? You know, so it's like, they have this whole, pro- this whole entire profile built around you as a person. And any time under a surveillance state like that, you could just, I mean, look how many laws every day, an everyday citizen probably breaks so many laws they don't even realize or think, oh, well, no one cares. I, I took this movie or whatever it is. Plus it makes you more, it makes you a more exploitable consumer too, because they, they have such a, 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 a good profile of you built up, but it's like, you know, half the time they're trying to sell you shit that you, you know, you don't want, they, you don't need. Well, before you even need it, before you want right. it or need it, they fucking create the desire within you. It's like, here you go. You want this. It's like, oh, I do. OK, yeah, I guess I do. It's all these advanced algorithms, dude. They just look at you. They look at what you've bought and they can figure things out about you. They know your medical problems. They know, you know, <laughs> your political beliefs. They know every fucking thing about you. So Kaczynski said that he uh, decided to advocate a revolution against the industrial system. He said this is not to be a political revolution. Its object will be to overthrow not governments, but the economic and technological basis of the present society. Fat fucking chance of that happening. So it's the Butlerian Jihad from the Dune universe. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. 
Um, it, it really, it's, it's this idea that machines and industry have taken over our every moment of our lives. And the advertising that TJ was just talking about is a huge part of that. If, the, if there's nobody to receive the things that the machines are making, then there's no point for the machines to be there. So keeping people constantly consuming the output of these machines is tantamount. Am I wrong about that? I don't think so. I really don't. I don't have a counter argument. <laughs> and so the idea becomes like at what it, it, this is the violent revolution idea. This is the we're not we're not this is not we're not trying to establish a political, you know, this is not about LGBTQ rights. This is not about the treatment of women. This is not a political or identitarian type of movement. Right. This is a technology is fucking killing us. And we have to dismantle the fucking yoke. Yeah, that's this been like, put around our neck. Yeah, this is like a battle more like for like the soul of humanity, the destiny of humanity, which what kind of direction we go in. It's humanity versus the corporations. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's talking about. It's like standing up to these giant business interests that we all know. We talk about it all the time as if it's just a fucking foregone conclusion that the natural order of things is for these giant fucking corporate entities to be on top. To be on top of you, pushing down on you, giving you an ever smaller slice of the pie and feeding you bullshit your entire life. How do you stop that? I think Ted Kaczynski's right that it can't be a political revolution. If you if you try and sow politics into this, it becomes fucking, it becomes mush. It becomes interpretable. It has to be directed. It has to be like, we're going to tear down the fucking Walmart in every, in every city. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I mean... The problem is that it's going to be inherently political no matter what, because people are going to bring their identity politics into it. People are going to invariably bring political ideology into it. And I mean, honestly, a lot of our political identities today are so contingent upon the spread of technology in the first place. Like, I don't think that I think that at this point, you know, there's no there's no untangling humanity from its technology. I don't I, I think that, you know, he makes some points about the downsides of technology He's ignoring a lot of upsides of technology and really he's talking about, I mean, unless, unless there's a cataclysmic event that sends us hurtling back in time to the, this sort of agrarian society, like this just isn't going to happen. I mean, just the amount of technology that's involved in just feeding a population this large. If you say, let's eschew all this technology, then you're basically saying there's going to be massive starvation. There's going to be, I mean, you, you, you can't, and, and you can't gonna, sustain the population numbers, look, which, you know, I don't even think our population should be as high as it is. No. But I mean, you're talking about, we're going to be, uh, you're going to lose a shit ton of modern convenience. Not everyone wants to live in a fucking cabin in the woods and hunt fucking game and be at the mercy of the elements and all <laughs> that's this other a deeper, stuff. That's a deeper question though. Because you ask you you ask yourself this, right? Yeah. We know that humans are animals. Sure. We know that for a profound amount of humanity's history, we lived just like that. Sure. Yes. Hunter gatherer tribes. Yeah. Right. And we're are we in the position to look back at those people through our modern lens and go like they would want what we have? Because that's what we're saying. We're, you're not just talking about yourself with this. You're I mean, talking about future generations that are born into a world where it's not mechanized. It's not in, uh, industrialized. Sure. They live in smaller agrarian self-contained communities that farm the land and provide for the common defense on a local level. I mean, I think we can, I think we can infer what decision they made because they got those generations led us to this point. So every piece of new technology that came along, embraced. humanity embraced without question. Sure. Because it, if this makes like when the printing press a, came about, it wasn't like, like people like, like, another thing is we have to ask like, where do we draw the line? Because, I mean, a fucking spear is a piece of technology. A bow and arrow is a piece of technology. Is he just drawing the line at the Industrial Revolution? Like, that's yes. when it went too far? That, well, that is where his I mean, line just, was drawn. We just talked the other day about the fucking, uh, how, you know, the disgusting conditions of pre-industrial society. Right. People shitting in this. I mean, like, it's a miserable fucking existence. Now, maybe the people who are born and raised into it can't tell the difference, and they think it's fine. But there's people in this society who don't even see the problems of this either. Right. So, I mean, like, we, we can't really necessarily talk about the, ex I mean, like, everything's obviously relative. The, f the, the contention that Kaczynski uh, is making is that we were wrong to go down the path we went. And it needs to be corrected. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, I don't, do you think it's even feasible? It's possible. But I think it's totally fucking possible. 
but it's look, you know, an individual. I mean, which is that's all he is. I mean, you can you can you can make an argument, but it's a cultural thing. I mean, as a society, we've made these changes. Now, by and large, there's people that eschew those changes and say, "No, like, I don't want to. I don't want to drive a car. I want a horse and buggy, like uh, always." Like Amish people. Yeah, you have people that you know just by their very way of life, them adopt those practices. I mean, the, that Amish are a good example. That Rumspringa thing. Yeah. Okay, so Amish people are given the option when they're teenagers to move out and go live like we do. Right. And then come back and everything's forgiven. And a profound amount of them do. Right. A huge uh, uh, majority of Amish children that go on Rumspringa come right. right back to the Amish fucking community. Of course they do. Yeah. So, well, we, right. So what I'm saying is, is we, it's not as it's simple not, it's, as it's shit a, was no, fucking. it's a bullshit test. It's a bullshit test because what you're saying, if you decide to go and leave the, you're saying, I forsake my family. Right. I forsake every social connection I've ever had throughout my life. I, I forsake your social everything sa- about my upbringing. It's like a false test. It's like you get to go in the world. This is what the world has to offer you. Yeah, your safety net. F- from a naive perspective yeah. of indoctrination and the knowledge that if you choose this, you're sacrificing literally everything and everything, everyone you've ever known to go out into a world that's completely unfamiliar to you. But so if it's not a fair in, test. It's a bullshit test. If they're living in pig room shit, Springa, though. Room Springa is a terrible fucking, it's not, it's not legit. It's bullshit. I, I think that I, I understand what you're saying. I understand the immense social pressure of that. Mm-hmm. But I also, you know, I caution you to think you're, you're saying that our fucking society is so much better now than it was when most people lived that way. I'm saying it's better in many ways. Right. I mean, look, like everything in life, you know, uh, I mean, not everything. Some things are just all downside. There's very few things that are all upside. But our, our relationship with technology, it's... Of course, it's fraught with peril and sacrifices and things that we've given up to embrace that. But, you know, we gave them up for a reason. We, we made trades. Now, maybe we made a deal with the devil in some instances. But, I mean, like, once again, I got to ask where you fucking draw the line. It's like, okay, do you want to till a field through backbreaking labor or do you want to have a fucking tractor? You know? And people said, hey, I would rather have the tractor because it's fucking easier. I can yield more crops. I can that led feed to, more people. That led to gigantic factory farms. It did. With frankencorn growing yes. in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, these giant entities gobbling up these big farmer conglomerates. Giant and be- conglomerations. You know uh, what I mean? That, that rule the fucking, the roots. Yeah, there's, there's farmers now, I don't know if you guys know this, but farming equipment that's like older, like from the 70s and the 80s and stuff is highly valuable because now these these big companies for these uh, farmers that do, do still exist, they have to hack their own shit to make it work, or they have to pay out like these outrageous prices to get stuff fixed. Right, you can't. They're like they're like Lamborghinis and shit. You can't yeah. work on them. And there's other uh, farmers too now that I mean, like are paid uh, are just paid not to grow anything, or paid uh, to, or grow paid things to grow things and things then that... allow them to rot on the field. Right. I mean, like corn and ethanol is a big example. It's like basically just a subsidy for farmers. Like, so we're not, I mean, like we're not, we're not uh, uh, managing our resources uh, in the greatest way. Well, you wouldn't think we would be because the, because the fucking goal is not to harness our resources and manage them. It's sustainable. It's to maximize profit. It's to, right. That's so the the entire goal of our society is anti-human survival. Cuz I mean think about this. Like yeah. if all of us have like in a capitalist system we all have our bank accounts. So we look at that. So we look at like, like or we look at roughly like these are our resources. And it's so strange that you could get someone to understand that like well yeah, I'm broke, I have no money, but it's like we don't look at all the natural resources and stuff we need to actually survive. Like how much clean drinking water do we have? But a lot uh, a lot of people are going to die if you eschew technology as well. Well, no, I'm not even saying that technology should be eschewed. I'm just saying that you know, I feel like the technology, it's like technology is good, but obviously there's downsides. Like, I think I think it's also, you have to look at the ethical questions about what technology can do. Because there's technology that obviously that can just, I mean, we're getting to the point where, you know, you're going to have technology that can just go kill people like that. Right. It's, it's not going to be, I mean, look, look at those dogs. Right. Imagine when you, if you put I mean, weapons on those things. What happens when you can send a fucking nanovirus or something what, into someone's what house? What happens if you can write a, a software program to make your the smartphone's battery go fucking crazy and, and heat up and explode? Well, right. Fuck that programming your dreams when you're hooked up in a fucking cybernetic way right to the mass internet they can be talking to your brain while you sleep oh yeah 
I mean, and, are, and we all they, it's like, our, it's we our, all know how suggestible people are in that state. Oh yeah, and I mean, of course they'll. I mean, they already want to do that. I mean, that's why you know. Um, you fall asleep watching commercial television, those commercials will creep into your fucking subconscious. Of course. And so it's it's about literally, as Ted Kaczynski was saying, taking control of every person on the planet and all important life forms. So it's, it's and, and we're doing that to the animals too. He, he talked about all other important species. Look at what we've done to the fucking dairy cow. We've turned <laughs> it into a monster. It's literally incapable of living on its own. Right. Because it's been so genetically fucked with that it created like those cows buckle under the fucking weight of their own udders. I mean, uh, chickens, uh, you, you mean, you know, uh, pigs, um, you know, these factory farms, of course, uh, crazy conditions. And like <laughs> the, the amount of <laughs> genetic modifications and, you know, weird breeding that they've done oh, dude. to create these uh, abominations, basically. Okay. Well, to feed this uh, ever-growing population. You know that I love to make Although I guess wings. population growth has uh, slowed down. Well, t- talking about the factory farming shit, you know I love fucking make chicken wings, right? Oh, yeah. You bought that pack of chicken wings, yes. and I bought the pack. Uh-huh. And my pack is like, you know, the Whole Foods, you know, rated right. and blah, blah, blah. So it's organic. Right. Long, long story short. And you bought just whatever they have at the fucking store. Yeah. Look at the difference between the, those are the wings you bought. And the, wing, and like, the wings I bought are like tiny. Yeah. They're like, like, you know, a couple bites of meat. The ones TJ got were just like, they were fucking huge. He got like six, seven pounds of meat. He got like about three times the amount of meat off these chickens. Right, because and, they're breeding them to be gigantic. And yeah, that, that, well, they, they, they and can't even stand up. Yeah. They're not even like, as a life form, they're basic. They I mean, they're just, they're not. I mean, just think about it. In a thousand years, they may have conglomerated all these animals, and there's just this big moaning pink goo <laughs> you know and it's got a tit coming well, out I mean, one side got, of it and a ham hock I mean, on the other we've already started to just uh clone i mean culture clone meat. meat yeah yeah but it's, it's meat that's just grown it's not even they're, they've just cut out the middleman of like it's pretty there's been an explosion in fake meat i mean yeah it's a, it, they've cut out the like there's not we're not talking about something with a brain anymore at, any, at this point we're just talking about like we're just literally growing parts and selling them to you sweet well, and basically what they, what they do is they Which imitate... Which actually is at least a little bit more ethical <laughs> because there's no actual uh, suffering involved. Well, beyond but. me, what, what what all these companies are doing is working on making it have that, like, kind of like myoglobin, like that like those enzymes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Where it's sort of like, so, like, it gives you that feel of, like, real beef. And I mean, they're just going to get better Fake and better. meat has gotten a lot more convincing as of late. I, I guarantee you, in probably the next 10 or 15 years, they're going to make it's shit... It's probably going to start getting indistinguishable. Yeah. You know what I haven't seen yet is, like, a, re- a really good, like, steak or anything, but... So... Before we uh, we move on from Ted Kaczynski, he had some ideas about how the revolution needed to be started. Okay. Um, he said, first, we must work to heighten the social stresses within the system so as to increase the likelihood that it will break down or be weakened sufficiently so that a revolution against it becomes possible. So this is how he's talking about accelerationism, right. like accelerating the bad kind of almost accepting the bad and allowing it to get so repugnant and bad and incompetent and incapable of fulfilling people's basic needs that that's how you get your apolitical revolution. Right. It's just like, I got no bread on my fucking table anymore. I can't support my family. I can't support myself. Then people will take to the street. So he doesn't, he doesn't like really talk about, yeah, let's all fucking get together as things are now and destroy the fucking Walmart in town. Right. He talks about letting things get so bad that people, you know, rightfully see who, who's done it to them. I mean, that's probably the most pragmatic uh, view of revolution is as when people can't eat, they can't meet their basic needs. So it's like, what do they have to lose? He says, second, it's necessary to develop and propagate an ideology that opposes technology and the industrial society. If, and when the system becomes sufficiently weakened. So he talks about, you know, that needs to be the, the, if there's a political statement, it needs to be that these giant fucking companies are evil. And when left to their own devices like they had been, they will enslave you and continue to give you crappier and crappier shit for more and more of your quote-unquote paycheck. Um, and such an ide- ideology will help to ensure that if and when industrial society breaks down, its remnants will be smashed beyond repair. So if the system cannot be reconstituted, the factory should be destroyed, technical books burned, etc. So he he was talking about getting people so behind the idea that technology was to blame for what was going on with them 
that they wouldn't even abide it anymore. They wouldn't even want that knowledge anymore, that every piece of technology would just be systematically dismantled. And- I mean, we kind of had something like this happen before um, in the Dark Ages. Sure. When a lot of Roman knowledge and stuff was destroyed, Library of Alexandria burned and stuff like that. And and knowledge of how to run a cleaner and more efficient society right. was just lost. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, I mean, it wasn't totally lost. It did survive in little... I mean, you're not gonna. I mean, going in from, wider <laughs> society, it was from, as good as going lost. from a, it was a strong, uh, a strong like sort of centralized government to a bunch of like fiefdoms and feudal states and yep. people fighting and you know all this stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, but you know, some of that knowledge did actually survive. A lot of it survived through uh, the Middle East and stuff, um, and was recovered. Ah, the, I see. I see. You are also a fan of uh, Spaceship Earth. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it did. I mean, it's true. I know. I know. I'm just. Um, but yeah, just reminded me of that. Uh, you know, well, humanity kind of. Uh, forsake that because it, it basically exactly the conditions you described too it was like society broke down to this point there wasn't necessarily we're again they didn't necessarily turn on their technology but they certainly you know they were overrun by the barbarians quote unquote that uh destroyed a lot of the knowledge and infrastructure and how it was built and how it was maintained and all that stuff um but of course like you know when you talk about like roman society and stuff you're talking about a society that's you know uh not only ultra decadent, but built largely upon like slave labor and yeah, stuff like that. Actually, a shoe technology because slave labor was so plentiful. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I guess uh, a lot Ted of Kaczynski the- might have liked Rome better. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he probably would have. Probably not. Probably, probably also found that system distasteful. <laughs> it's more in line with what he believed, though. Ted Kaczynski's ideology is inherently uh, humanistic. It's about increasing humanity's happiness and ability to deal with its environment. It, you know, it's about returning to this ideal that he has in his head that might not exist at all. But there are other people that would be called neo-Luddites, at least uh, in ideology. Really? Because I, I honestly find him to be uh, a sociopathic narcissist that's trying to shove his beliefs onto the world violently. I mean, isn't that just, that's a convenient way of tying off his <laughs> political observations. That's what everybody did with him. Oh, he's a fucking crazy fuck. Think, yeah, he's a crazy pe- fuck. I think people were right to do that. I mean, this is, I don't a guy, think so. this is a guy who decided to build bombs and to send them to people who... Who fucking cares? Who ha- I mean, they had no fucking involvement How does in that this- change what he has to say on the subject of technology and how it's it fucking... It absolutely changes it. It doesn't. It, it changes it, it 100%. I separate, I separate the man <laughs> from the deed and shit. His, right. his words are his words. And if you read sure. his manifesto, there's a lot of fucking correctness I mean, you know, going he on. Could, he could have some points, but I mean, like at the end of the day, he's not a fucking humanist. Humanists don't blow people up. Well, I mean, you know, in his mind, he was a humanist. Maybe. Maybe <laughs> in I, his deluded I, mind. I think his goal Look, overall I, was a humanistic goal. No, I think it was a selfish goal. I think he personally wanted to live in a world that eschewed technology and he couldn't stand that other people didn't agree with him. Well, there you go. A controversial figure. Another controversial figure. I didn't pull a picture of him. I kind of wish I had. He's a guy who I like to uh, I throw are around. Ready? Are we ready for this? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. fine. You can leave that up. Uh, there's a, uh, I guess he would be a neo-Luddite, uh, kind of a radical environmentalist philosopher named Derek Jensen. I always name Oh, yeah, drop. you've talked about yeah. him. Before. He's my favorite living philosopher. And he has kind of a, he has kind of a, uh, he's, he's, yeah, he's my Wittgenstein. <laughs> Um, he has a philosophy that's way more based around the health of the planet. Right. He thinks that humans are secondary. Radical environmentalism. Right. Um, and a lot of what he preaches involves taking down existing infrastructure that harms the environment. So smog belching pollution and dams that destroy local fish populations. Yeah, roadways that, uh, impede migratory, uh, I mean, look, talk about this wall that's being, um, slowly but probably not surely built. Oh, right. That's also devastating um, uh, migration routes and uh, damaging rivers and stuff like that. But he has an interesting uh, kind of divergence because he's not necessarily anti-technology. Right. He's a big supporter of green technology and the idea of integrating our technology with the earth. And it's a, it's a way that uh, things might turn out for us that I don't think people think about a whole lot. What about like a Garden of Eden? See, a lot of times people look at the Earth in the future, they think of something like, you know, that last picture. That this was giant a, cybernetic right. ball where all nature has been squeezed out of the equation, basically. Right. And uh, I think it's equally possible that technology could go 
the other way. Right. There's a uh, kind well, of isn't a, something like this the kind of I mean like people make fun of uh, the Green New Deal and stuff like that and that those kind of ideas is like ah oh, this is ridiculous and they want us to give up this and they want us to give up that. But isn't this kind of what that sort of legislation is sort of aiming towards is like we need to build an infrastructure that's not damaging to our environment but works like or at least minimize simpatico with it minimize the damaging footprint of our species to the greatest greatest extent possible um to integrate with nature wherever possible why why would people not want to live in a healthier environment and we saw this with uh i think uh it's not like let's make it clear it's not people that oppose that (laughs) it's fucking uh giant yeah well it's it's giant corporations that oppose and some people do think they oppose it because they're fed all this bullshit like brainwash they want to fucking take away your your cows for farting and they want to stop you from air travel and they want to do this and they want to do that and it's just you know they get all all these uh lies fucking crammed into their skull to the point, and they're too stupid to fucking. Tell I'm not the sure where so. I saw this. Maybe it was on this show. Maybe it was just in my personal life. But the other thing with Singapore, that they like, remember the um, they basically like clean the rivers out around the uh, like uh, the cities mm-hmm. and like these like platypuses and uh, it was like some animal like I remember it was, some, it was some river animal that was like returning and thriving in a major metropolitan area. Right. So it's like that, that, that philosophy has already been shown that it's actually way better for the animals in the ecosystem. It's way better for the people. It's way better for their mental health and their mental state to have spaces like this because cities actually stress people out a lot because, like, you know, obviously the human brain has not evolved much in 50,000 years, so we're used to seeing more, like, outdoor spaces. Mm-hmm. And something like this, I think, would, I mean, even to, maybe not from, the, I don't know, a practical aspect, uh, a respect, but a pragmatic one just to have a place of, like, of, where it's more serene. I mean, but what does that come at the cost of? No fucking monster truck rallies. I can't imagine the WWE, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, you, look. The, the, you, so what's the cost I mean, it's of, a matter of, of serenity? Of, right. It's just a matter of, like, what are you willing to sacrifice to gain? I mean, you know, the, you know, it, it's you trade certain things for others, right? You live on a more sustainable planet, Uh you know, there's more green spaces. Yeah, maybe maybe you can't. Maybe you know, meat production has to go way down. Yeah, maybe so you have to eat a more vegetarian diet, or maybe fucking meat is just excluded from your diet whatsoever. Or maybe it's you know switched over to where we're just producing protein in a yeah, green artificial right. meat. in some other way. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that monster truck rallies necessarily have to stop. They might. You, you definitely have to change the way a monster what a monster truck is. I mean, they, they, you wouldn't, they, it wouldn't exist. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about there that. There wouldn't be monster truck rallies. <laughs> There's probably, you know, you could probably figure They're out They're monuments to, to all, excess. It's about burning as much fucking natural <laughs> fuel yeah, all as possible. Electric monster trucks. I mean, you could have an all electric. They're, they're doing an all electric Hummer pretty soon. You could do an electric fucking monster truck powered by a fucking solar or something. Hey, Who knows? Well, maybe so. <laughs> it, it, you know, Hey, I mean, you know, you if, never if that know. seems like all the balls have been removed from monster <laughs> trucks at that point. That you know is, what I mean? It's true. And I mean, look, uh, you're going it, to, it's going to be way more of a hippy dippy kind We're of fucking a carbon outlook on neutral, life. Uh, monster truck event. Right. <laughs> it's just like, no, we don't call them monster trucks anymore because that sounds a little too scary. Now they're just uh, super trucks, you know, or some shit. What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, we're going to the uh, the Enviro Fair to watch the Electro Crusher sustainably destroy some old cars. And return them back to the environment. Hooray! There you go. It mulches them into uh, organic material, yep. you know? And then it's totally compostable. Yeah. Great. Which, you Let's know, go. for the people that lived in this society might be badass, but for us it kind of sucks. Right. But once again, we're coming at it from our, you know, perspective here. Right. But uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it would be a pussier future for sure if we're going to get on that real, like, level and shit, but... I don't know. It's probably a more sustainable one than, I mean, our, our current trajectory doesn't, it doesn't have, it, it's not looking well for us. I think we do need to fucking have some sort I mean, of fundamental I, shift for sure. I mean, you say that TJ, but you know, if you're fucking walking like the hanging gardens and you know, you're like, Hmm, look, I don't even I'm like, not, I don't even like fucking nature. So, I mean, I go yeah, outside. Well, you I'm like what it like, provides but you. Dude, this is, yeah, of course. This is your little dome TJ. Like this is like, you're like your nature excursion. You I mean, know? I do see some bananas there. So yeah, there's some nanners, dude. you know, some citrus well, fruits. Did, you walk in there, you pick the fucking fruit from the tree. You sit around basking in the sunlight. Your life's just simple then, TJ. See, I'm not, I'm not really a basker, so. Bask in the sunlight, TJ. Yeah, I like. I kind of like artificial environments, but. Yeah, but see, if you've been raised in this society, you would like it. Maybe. I this mean, be like your if you were raised in this society, look at that. That's an artificial environment. Yeah. 
Those, but see that that's what I'm saying. Would you be adverse to these carefully designed gardenscapes? And no, shit? I mean I guess not. Probably not. Fuck that's what no. I, that's what I'm saying. You're, I don't think you would be as adverse to this type of a society as you think you might. Be. Uh, you're probably right. But that all just kind of depends on perspective, and we're trying to paint our perspectives onto people thousands of years in the future. So here's an idea of how, like, you could do something like, I guess, a skyscraper right. in this kind of uh, world. Where and and this, this has already cool. been done, not to this extent, but uh, there are skyscrapers that have green spaces out on patios at various levels. Right. Uh, you know, so this is already, you know, creating these things that are functional for us to continue a more modern way of living, but that don't interfere as much with the environment this kind of seems like you know <laughs> like you're trying to compromise really between modernity and nature like okay we, we can't destroy nature just for our own selfish egotistical we can live, needs we, we can live in balance out, with it we need yeah. to figure out some way to balance our technological progress with you know and, and preserve nature this at the same be, time well, yeah but but if you the idea behind design is and this city, is like you know this is striking this this this, this kind of requires human beings to strike a very delicate balance because nature is all about balance so this really requires us to strike a very delicate balance and figure out exactly what the impact of every single it's, little thing it's we something do is. humanity sorely needs to do though well if you think about it in conjunction with some of the other technological advancements that we'll talk about later on today like AI yeah. An AI would have a way easier time figuring, figuring out kind of how to design out. things that are functional and useful and increase, you know, the happiness and, and uh, life quality of human beings while leaving the smallest ecological footprint possible. I mean, that may be possible. And um, I don't want to get too deep into the AI thing now, but, no. you know, we I, I do have some follow-up questions on that, but we should probably wait for that, that sure. section. But, um, um so there's kind of these branches of futurism, kind of fringe branches that have started to become uh, way more active in the last 10, 15 years. techno and uh, bright green environmentalism, they're called. Yeah. And both of them ki are kind of uh, advocating for this, not necessarily eschewing technology, but developing technology that's ever more in harmony with our environment with the end goal being something like this. So this is kind of a compromise between like the 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 classic futurist and the the kind of neo luddite sort of philosophy we were describing earlier. This exactly. Is like, this is kind of like, hey, here's a middle ground that we think could work. It's not a corporate dystopia, and it's not literally living in a log log cabin, dying of cholera, at fucking twenty five years right. old. Well, it's, it's using the technology. It's harnessing that power of the technology to try to live as much as possible within balance with nature, and obviously. I mean, if you look at the way cities are designed now, it's like they're designed for vehicles. They're not designed for people. Well, this, is a city that, this is a city that actually would be designed for people and the animals that would live in this environment. The answer to this is summed up in one word, energy. We have to come up with a way to harness massive amounts of energy in a way that doesn't spew pollutants into the fucking environment. It, solar's not good enough. Wind is not good enough. The amount of power needed to generate this type of a society and the technology that would b obviously back it is immense. I mean, solar really should be, it should be good enough. I'm talking modern solar. Right. I mean, it's going like, to have to be some quantum leap in the efficiency of solar. It's not really, and battery technology it's not well. really that the, it's not really that the, the sun doesn't have, I mean, the sun is the source of energy for pretty much, the, I mean, the entire planet. Yeah. There's enough, it produces enough some energy. geothermal stuff. Right. So, I mean, it's just that we're not very good at collecting and harnessing its fucking energy. Right. We've got to get, we got to have like a quantum leap in that type of technology. It just has to absolutely and fundamentally change to something that's way more efficient and capable of gathering way more fucking energy than it is now. Uh, absolutely. We're still living in a society we're still that burning, is, we're still burning fossil fuels. We're still burning coal. We're still burning coal. Um, you know, we're, st we're still <laughs> digging, we're still fracking. Well, for solar fuck's sake. is increasingly becoming the cheapest, uh, method of, of, uh, electrical power generation. I mean, we have a giant ball of fucking nuclear energy. Just giving us there, free fucking energy. Called the sun. And we've, we've yet to really figure out how to harness that energy. Now, look, these things we're seeing all over the place here, these plants, you know, they're really fucking good at it. They figured out how to do it. Well, that's kind of the idea, I think, behind this movement is creating technology that more emulates the natural world than diverges from it. Yeah. So maybe what we're talking about here is some kind of strange fusion between constructing and growing a building 
You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I don't know, but I just wonder. I wonder how how feasible. I mean, like, uh, I guess I I don't. I mean, I wonder. I mean, this would obviously have some 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 you know issues as well. Like people don't like uh, bugs. <laughs> people don't necessarily want to live amongst wild animals and stuff. Which obviously this would have to accommodate if it's really going to be in synchrony with nature. Right. Um, so, you know, there's going to be stuff that human beings have to give up for this. I mean, because we're just looking at it. Oh, it's lush and it's green and it's happy. But, I mean, there's a lot of drawbacks here. Like, you know, there's going to be ants in your fucking house and shit. Nah, not going to happen, TJ. I mean, I don't see that there would have to be ants in your fucking house. Not necessarily. Maybe there's going to be ants. I mean, there's there's going to be insects in all of these little forested areas at every tier of this fucking be, giant you know skyscraper. They're, they're sure. important to the ecosystem. Of so, course they are. You know, I mean, it, but it, they're also it, an annoyance to us. Sure, they're an on annoyance. On a personal but, kind of human level, you know, sacrifices are going to have to be made, large and small. Sure, and we already. So, I mean, obviously, we we make way worse sacrifices for a way worse. Society I mean, lo- look now, at look so. at using fossil fuels. Look what that's doing to the environment. Oh yeah, I'd argue having to put up some ants is uh, nothing compared to the damage we're doing there. You're probably right. But why fix what we've got when we can just go get another one? Let's just get yeah! out of here. Yeah. We got to talk about a possible future for society, and that is a society that escapes the planet Earth and colonizes the galaxy to varying degrees. It's like, yeah, we use this piece of shit up next. Um, now, you know, uh, right now, this is science fiction. But to say that it's not a possible future for humanity, given the constant doubling of technological complexity that we see, I think is a little short-sighted. Sure. I think this is a completely possible step. And there's a lot of questions with this step. There's a lot of questions. Do we remain one entity? Like, if we spread far enough, that's kind of what Dune uh, embraces. No, in a lot I mean, of we're going to become... I mean, look, it, even if we do stay on this planet, uh, you know, we're going to talk about transhumanism later in my part of this this two-part episode we're doing on these these uh, futures, but... yeah. Um, you know, even if we even if we do stay on this planet, humanity, in my opinion, is going to diverge in different ways. It's gonna we're gonna be different species. It might not even be through the Darwinian process of natural selection. It might just be through uh, artificial sort of augmentation, um, or some combination of the two. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, if it you could get very well human populations, but if you start far enough apart with oh yeah, absolutely no cultural drift, then you're gonna have different species of human oh yeah and i mean look if you start putting human beings all over the fucking um galaxy if we develop something that is that's uh, the equivalent of warp drive technology and we're able to get we're able to break that uh hard light speed um speed limit that the galaxy seems or all of the universe uh, well then you have to either find suitable uh habitats for humans or suitable planets i mean you know star trek at the class m planet yeah, I mean, like, you know, is it going to be... Or terraforming. Gonna be, it's going to be a matter of finding other habitable planets, terraforming planets. Uh, some people will probably live in space on space stations and stuff like I that. I mean, at, at some point during this, a profound amount of people will just live in space. I mean, well, you know, if, 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 this, is, if this is the future, if this is what happens, then eventually there's going to be way more people off Earth than there are on, probably by a significant margin at some point. Um, and, you know, you are going to see divergence. You're going to see... Uh, you know, human civilizations go in very different ideological directions, and you're probably going to see them undergo sort of, uh, you know, Darwinistic evolutionary changes, and there's going to be artificial changes, and there's going to be different societies that allow different sort of augmentations to different well, sorts you know, of human beings. One of the big things you have, we haven't really brought up yet is the, what about the philosophy behind such a, a group? Like, in you know, Star Trek universe... It's going to probably be very... I don't think you're going to have something like the United Federation of Planets where it's going to be we're all... I think it's going to be way more like Babylon 5 where the people in space and the people on Earth don't necessarily agree. And there's probably going to be something that's kind of like maybe the equivalent of like an American Revolution style. Hey, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't take mar- our marching orders from this fucking little blue and green globe anymore. We, we're, we got our own shit going on. Um, now, I don't know if that is, is you know, going to lead to outright war or something. But I don't see if you're living on Mars, even just Mars, not even talk about inner galactic shit just talking about inner solar system there's gonna shit. be differences you know Different eventually issues. if mars becomes an advanced enough society they're gonna look at earth and be like why the fuck are we still listening to these fucking doesn't morons? that depend though think about it from the other perspective yeah. think about it like there is some big giant global government that comes along right 
and unifies the people's vision and provides a completely standard living environment on Mars right. that's indistingu- indistinguishable uh, from Earth other than just geography. Sure. You know what I mean? Um, I guess a lot of it would depend on how far, how long, how easy is travel between the two places. If it's super easy, then, you know, probably not. But well, I mean, we like, have to presume it gets easier and easier. Eventually, you get to a point where there's going to be some sort of human separatist shit that's going to be like, we don't really want to... We don't really like these values anymore. We I want think to have that, our own values. I think that's going to come later. I think that comes after it's been humanity is way yeah. more far flung. Yeah. Because when you're talking about that, t- I think they could maintain the solar system under one standard of living. Sure. Where people looked at the planets that we were able to inhabit and that we terraformed within the solar system as basic analogs of one another. Mm-hmm. And uh, I could totally see that happening under some kind of cohesive nas- or, uh, multinational government some kind of giant world organization that kind of uh, provides for that. I could also see it going your way where it's like the technology escapes the, the public se- sector into the private sector and people are able to make those choices and start colonizing, you know, ever more distant worlds and shit. You know, well, yeah, another I mean, thing that's going to have a profound impact on um, this kind of stuff here. And I see we have some Dune imagery here. Um, and this kind of this kind of goes to that that other that idea you were just talking about of uh, humanity spread throughout the stars, but um, another thing that you got a uh, question here is you know we don't really know to what extent there's other life in this galaxy. We don't know if we don't know how common um, advanced civilizations are. We don't know how many spacefaring species there might be out there. We don't know how. You know, two alien species necessarily interact with each other. We don't know if there's hostile uh, forces out there that might not really appreciate our encroaching into, uh, you know, space. Well, that's kind of like the Star Trek future. Right. We start to explore our own local area and we discover that just on the you know borders of that, there's this completely ideologically opposed society of humanoids you know what i mean i mean it might not is i'm not i don't want to necessarily limit it to humanoids i think right, there, i understand i think there might be other humanoids i mean i don't i don't know we just don't know enough about alien life because we don't even know if it exists i mean it's a big question, i'm right? pretty sure that it does but we don't know how common life is we don't know how similar of a path it follows throughout the universe it could be that we're dealing with species that are totally beyond our imagining, yeah, have, or it could be that they're we have no more idea. similar to us than we imagine they would be. Uh, Until we encounter such a species, we have no idea. Because we only have one example of life emerging we, we can, uh, that we can take a look at. Right. One idea behind what you're talking about um, that I looked into, I didn't really pull anything about it. It's the this idea of the great filter. Have you ever heard of that? No. So... There's this this idea that kind of answers the question of like if if life is as common as some scientists say it could be right if there's this many Earth like planets out there yeah which you know it could be trillions of them in the in the universe sure um, then there should be we should see spacefaring civilizations why haven't we right the great filter idea is that there is some point in technological evolution for a species where they discover something. And the people that talk about this call it the great filter that inexorably destroys that society and stops it from progressing any further. Right. It's like it, it, it discovers some fundamental power in the universe that it tries to harness that ends up destroying it. Oh, we found the fucking, you know, basically something like more powerful than an atom bomb or something like some sort of piece of... It might just be a lot of people, a lot of great filter thinkers think that the at- atomic power is that. Right. That eventually, you know, you get bigger and bigger atomic weapons and that, <clears throat> that you know, you don't, or it could you don't be progress even, past that. even more powerful than that. Or, or it could be some right. other fundamental law of fucking nature that we don't know about, some underlying secret but of once, the universe. Once we discover it, it's just like, okay, now we're just, It goes wild and we destroy ourselves or it destroys us or some combination of the two. Well, one thing we haven't really uh, discussed with this is what about the... Uh, I mean, obviously, we're talking about, you know, a, a government run, you know, like, oh, we have the United Federation of Planets or whatever, but we haven't talked about the corporate future, like UAC or something, you know. We, <laughs> right. Or, what if it, What if we do get, become a spacefaring civilization, but it's not necessarily the government that's at the head of it. It's SpaceX it's, or something. Yeah, it's fucking these private sure. companies with their private interests. I think that's totally, like, a reasonable thing to, to assume. I mean, it, it's definitely a possible path to that. 
And it certainly would, you know, if you had these giant global mega corporations, I mean, there's where the money would come from. A tremendous amount of resources is going to have to be spent getting to the point that we're talking about. And corporations are fucking experts at amassing mass amounts of resources and amassing other corporations. And imagine it. Well, imagine the amount of resources you can get from space too. Like, oh, these elements that are rare on Earth. Oh, it's plentiful here. Oh, and yeah. of course, they control the route, the trade routes to get that. Like, aren't we running out of helium on this planet? Yeah, yeah, or, I've heard that. Isn't that like it's a gonna dwindling be, resource at this point? It's going to be you know thousands and thousands of years before we run out. But yes, I mean, there's a finite amount of everything here. We're running yeah, out right. of everything. So basically, like at some point, it makes. I mean, it's going to make just financial sense for them to turn to space and say, "This is where." We got to go to get these resources. It's gonna. We we're gonna have. Well, to. yeah. It, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to mine asteroid belts and mine inhospitable worlds for their resources. And, to and be the alien back. universe. That's ostensibly what they were doing. Just yeah. going like, yep, let's go and mine this shit because there's it's so plentiful in this you know fucking rich mineral or whatever or, or heavy or earth metals you need. Because I mean, eventually you're gonna like like Paul like we said, you're gonna run out of this shit if you go far enough in the future. Some of these resources that we're we're gonna need for technology. Might not be as plentiful on this planet. So we, we've talked a lot about expanding out. This last one was all about humanity expanding out. But what if we go a different route? What if we explore deeper inward? This is another possible future humanity. I got a picture of Neo from the Matrix up here. Whoa. Um, alternatively, or in conjunction with space travel, we could uh, attain an ideal existential mode by uploading ourselves into massive supercomputers. It's an idea that makes a lot of sense, given the computational capacity of a megascale computer. So think about what you could do if your consciousness lived in a giant, simulated, perfect world most of the time. Right. And if you wanted to interact with the outside world... You could comfortably do that by taking over some sort of robotic or android body here. Right. To experience, you know, what you needed to do in the real world and then lived basically as, uh, you know, a bunch of data in a giant supercomputer. Well, I mean, the advantages to that sort of existence would be very difficult to ignore. Um, because at that point, if there is a stable sort of Here's the the network, here's the hub, here's the node, here's whatever the fuck it is where, you know, you have this customizable individual world where you are basically God and you could go interact with other people in their little worlds and you can invite each other over and, hey, come over to my fucking world. You and could do create this. people to interact right. with. The need for actual human to human interaction goes away. Yeah, I mean, I mean you can. Yeah. You could do that. You I'm could just saying, do it like, if you want, you I guess. Do, I mean, I'm just saying you could you could have, uh, yeah, you could have your own avatar kind of characters that are just there to you know give you someone to uh, talk to. It's or interact basically with. they create your own reality adventure. You could reality have is whatever you, you want could to go. Be. You could communicate with other people who have their own realities. You could communicate with other fucking consciousnesses that are, you know, maybe they have a biological origin. Maybe they have an artificial origin. Um, like Paul said, you can go like or to like the, what's understood as like the base reality you could of choose everyone to just be like, I don't even want to have a consciousness. I just want to exist as like pure vibrating pleasure for uh, however long this system exists. Um, you know, and there's no there's no need unless you want it for there to be any uh, struggle, turmoil, strife. You have total difficulty. control over your world, right? Your world is whatever you want it to be at you're any given moment. I mean, you're just God. You have right. You have whatever you want. I mean, it's all simulated, but that doesn't matter at well, a certain point. I mean, assuming that... we know this is all simulated. Yeah, right. So, well, I mean, like, might as well go with the better simulation, right? <laughs> well, if you're assuming that, then you have to assume that if all of humanity does that, obviously that's the last generation of humans, unless it, there's going to be some artificial right. brains of the creating dis people. The, distinguish, uh, the distinction between artificial intelligences and biological intelligences ends when the last person walks into the fucking machine. Right. When the last person uploads himself to the fucking machine, then it just be, we become data. I mean, there might be a, it might be the case that, uh, society <laughs> continues around this. This is just a, 
Well, someone would have to make so certain you, people make this choice. So you either need AI or robots to make that feasible, though, because if everyone uploads themselves into such I mean, a system... It might be the case that some people don't want to go into this fucking system. Probably. Like, this isn't p- real. It's bullshit. It's just like you're just living in a fucking bullshit fantasy world. Fuck that. Well, you're talking about the most interesting part of this, which is not necessarily the end goal, but the transition. Right. There's going to be a transitional period where, yes, the real world still matters, and people have ever more access to this fantasy world that gets better and better at at completing them as, as oh, yeah. human beings. And they're going to have to interact in the real world. And the distinguishment between those two kind of in the middle of this transition is, I think, the most interesting time. Right. Because you're right. There's going to be fractures of humanity that want to live in the machines all the time. And there's going to be people in the real world, well, we don't want to fucking slave away so you can just fantasize in your video game all day. You know what I mean? There's right. going to be this kind of inherent conflict. With this outcome, though, eventually for humanity, we're assuming that slowly but surely everyone's going to join in. This gets better. And to the point where people are just like, I can't resist this enticement. Right. right. I mean, I guess I would, I'd probably never believe that 100% of people would do it, but let's just say 99.9%. I mean, just look at the. Maybe there's some hermits in the woods or something. Look at the adoption (laughs) of technology between our generation and Zoomers. Right. You know what I mean? And we're probably uh, higher end examples of technology users in our generation. The generation that came before us is even more stark. You know what I mean? Look at three or four generations max. Right. How much invasive technology people have, you know, the people that don't want to be there are going to die off in two or three generations. Yeah. When kids are born with access to this shit and when it's the status quo and all the cool kids are in the fucking matrix, it's like, yeah. It's, it's going to be three or four generations before humanity just decides, like, hey, this is the way to fucking go. And then you got this, uh, I mean, like, if there, if there do arise new consciousnesses, they'd probably arise within the fucking, you know, program or whatever the fuck. Well, just like point. it can with pictures, there's this weird website called thispersondoesntexist.com. Mm-hmm. And it's, go to it real quick. Okay. I think it's called This Person Doesn't Exist or this person does not exist. And it's literally a generated human being that's indistinguishable because it just takes parts of other people. Right. So this is a, this is a person that does not exist. And I guess you just refresh this and it'll just keep giving you notes. Uh, Yep. Yep. Don't exist. So this is fucking insane. I mean, it's literal photo realism. It's like, and, and if you take this to the data side of things, you're absolutely right. They're going to just be creating new human consciousnesses within the machine. Right. By taking what it's studied of other human beings and making this amalgamation of desire and and all of this, it, it leads to us being a homogenous Hey, this guy does exist. Single I actually know this guy. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I met this dude. Oh, yeah? You yeah. saw him at the, <laughs> at the liquor store? This website is bullshit. I'm kind of glad this dude I mean, doesn't exist. This dude looks like a douche. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, you have to assume too. I mean, if you go in, if you go inside of like a simulated <coughs> reality like this, I mean, if all if, if you have the collective brain power of humanity and combined with those machines and just ref- and, and I guess you know if that's what our because I mean you have to if, if, if assume that people are going to be working continuously within that reality to refine this technology and make it better and better, right? Or there's at least an a, a, an AI directive doing that on the outside. Well. Absolutely. I mean, or on the inside. I mean, maybe we're probably, just integrating with an AI. Well, probably both, if you think about <laughs> it, because it, it, it will still exist with, with you know, in this base reality, which, you know, people are then going to go and simulate. I mean, all, I mean like, I, I would, it's, it's just kind of crazy to think, like, one of the weird things about the transitions, what do you do with the bodies? Like, is there like an incineration process or something? We're talk, we're, yeah, we're talking about, like, you're downloading your fucking consciousness into the machine, yeah, so, so you mean, don't need your body anymore. Right. Well, I'm saying, but yeah, but obviously they're, 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 they're going to do something with the body after it's... Um, right. Make it into Soylent Green. Yeah. Maybe power. Maybe the fucking body gets... Uh, <laughs> they burn it to fucking power the machine or something. But they would have nobody to feed the Soylent Green to. I don't know. Maybe the other people. The, will, other, the other humans that are holding on. Uh, well, maybe during that time, yeah. But that, yeah, but then eventually there's no bodies to be destroyed. Because, I mean, like, let's be honest. Like, you're right. There, a, a, any sort of new life forms are going to be created within that universe, not with... I mean, without. there's really no way to actually do this. I mean, there is a way to do it. But there's no way for your consciousness... Like, you're not going to continue on the machine. They're basically going to replicate you in the machine, and then well, you're yeah, just going to be yeah. killed. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> you might... It, it might be seamless, 
But really what's happening is your consciousness is not being transferred so much as it is being recreated Copied. elsewhere. Well, it's the same and thing with teleportation. Just, it's yeah. like you're being killed and then reconstituted at another distant location. Right. So, I mean, you know, that's always been, that's always been the big philosophical, like, eh, I'm not so sure about this for me, you know, cause it's not a true continuation. But then again, I remember that, you know, every cell in your body is replaced every seven years or every atom rather. Right. So, I mean, you're not even, I mean, if you you're could not just, even, you're if, not if even was, the same matter you were fucking. If seven there was no ago, distinguishing so. between the two, then I don't really see the fucking problem with it. Yeah, I guess so. It's not that I, it, nanosecond of I, death that I fear. You know I what get, I mean? I get hung up on that for whatever reason. Um, um, What's this? What are we doing here? This this is the fantasy world, right? This is like the sure, sure, just you know, just a big fantasy picture, something that you could create for yourself, a place that you could live if you wanted, and probably just a very, uh, you know, unvisionary representation because this is you know done by a human artist in the real world. I mean, think about the types of things hum- humans could imagine if they, you know, the yoke was completely taken off. Oh, yeah. Structural integrity doesn't matter. Gravity doesn't matter. Food and water, you don't need that anymore. Yep. You know what I mean? Have um, it if you want it, but right. you don't have, you know, you don't even have to be limited to a human body. You don't even have to have a form at all. You could right. just exist as the environment. You could do whatever the fuck you wanted. So, I mean, it's just an insane thing to think about and, you know, a totally possible uh, future scenario for humanity, given that our technology stays on the same track it's on now. We get ever better at creating these simulated yeah. realities. I mean, essentially, you just become like the fucking like the programs of the Matrix. Obviously, they have the physical representations in the movie. But, yeah, you can have a physical form. You can have any form. It doesn't matter. You could even make it you're where not- you can even make it where you're unaware that you're even in a fucking simulation. Yeah, you you're could just, do that. You, you, I mean, there, you there's could just be like, I, I'm God and I've always existed. Yeah. Right. Why? And I mean, the appeal is going to be so strong for some people. I mean, h- I mean, how can you resist something like that? I mean, existing in something like that, you're not going to be Scotty for very long. You know what I mean? You're not going to be Paul for very long. You might be when, you're, when you first show up and you don't really know the extent of what you're capable of doing. You might tackle the early stages of that as Paul and some vestige of Paul might remain in what you ultimately end up being. But right. I mean, like I'd imagine, and this is just, I don't know, you know, you, you, you'd probably start with something that was sort of analogous to the real world, but was probably influenced by like cult, you know, the fantasies you garnered as a human being. Well, if you think stuff. about it for people that are plugging into this, that are coming from the real world right. and being downloaded for the first time, that's absolutely necessary. Right. You can't just throw them into the mishmash of creation. You know what I mean? Yeah. You put them in a little house and you enter, it's like a tutorial. Yeah. You introduce them into how they're able to interact with their environment. Right. And then, but I mean, eventually you're just going to, all of that. I mean, like once people really start to, to adapt to the fact that like, oh, I can now, I mean, there's just nothing I well, can't do. You think about it too. The tra- there's, in the transitional phase, there's probably going to be times where people can just hook up to these and not, you know, their physical body won't necessarily That's be how that. it'll start. It's yeah. going to be an optional interface. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get an interface with my brain. i play directly. games on this thing that plugs right into my brain. Yeah. And that's going to get ever better at simulating reality to the point where people are going to start to question, like, why am I in, why, why do yeah, I have I'm to here. unplug this fucking thing? You know what I mean? When I'm in there, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah, you're when I'm out here, I'm suffering like a you know piece of rotting meat. Which you are. Right. <laughs> I think, you know, what scares people most about this future is that you're so tied into your identity as you. You're the way you look, the way you feel, the limitations of the reality you live in. But I think it, they're not factoring in, like, if this technology is perfected and there would be no difference to you, if you wanted to live in a reality like this, you could. Yeah. Or you could totally reject the reality and be like, I'm going to explore the cosmos now and have adventures and do whatever the fuck I want. But they're not realizing that your limit, you know, the possibilities you have here are incredibly limited in comparison to a simulated reality in which you're basically the director of that I mean, reality. some people would say you have no possibility in a simulated reality because nothing you create has any weight to it or mass. It doesn't persist. It's just I think a, that a the, figment. I mean, I think well, that's, here it's, on it's, Earth, if you build a I stone think that's wall, why you, you know? could... I think that's why you could probably say, I think that's why a lot of people might get in there, but choose to like not have any awareness that they're in a simulation, like come up with some other reason why this has happened or just choose to forget well, their human life I mean, altogether. They'd have to prove the, the worth of this reality versus that one. I don't think you can really do that. I mean, yeah, you can build the stone wall, but that exists here. If you're, if you're not living in that reality, it's irrelevant to you if there's a stone wall there or not. Right. 
Who I mean, cares? Most stone walls that exist are largely irrelevant to you. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. As like of now, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, how do you define the worth of that? Like, how, why is the simulated reality worth less than this reality you were born into? The 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 real like the the things that people will probably I mean the people will probably struggle with some of the philosophical ramifications of this, but I think that it's it, you know if something like this comes about, it's gonna be too enticing for people. For a lot of people, anyway, there's, I mean, a, yeah, there's a very good chance at it least, will. There's at least going to be a sizable part of the population that chooses this. Yeah, if it's not everyone, it's going to be a lot of people. I would say. I think it, on a long enough time scale, there won't be anyone else. I mean, may, maybe you're right. I mean, I, 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 I you know, I, I, it's hard for me to believe a hundred percent of something's going to happen, but I would believe, I would definitely believe the vast majority of people would adopt it. So, another option, and this is a pretty complex one. Uh, it's called a singleton. Um, it's very possible that the technological singularity will be an extinction event. The onset of radically advanced machine intelligence, perhaps as early as 30 years from now, will be so beyond our control and understanding that it will likely do us in, whether it happens deliberately, accidentally, or by our own mismanagement of the process. But the same awesome power that could destroy us could also result in the exact opposite. It's this possibility that a machine intelligence could create a veritable utopia for humanity that has given rise to the singularitarian movement. Um, if future AI designers can guide and mold the direction of these advanced systems, and most importantly, their goal orientation, it's conceivable that we could give rise to what's called a friendly AI, a kind of Asimovian intelligence or Asimovian intelligence that's incapable of inflicting any harm. And in fact, it could also serve as a supremely powerful overseer and protector. So I talk a lot about AI. I like thinking about AI. This is my favorite of the futures, the creation of something that is infinitely better than us to take care of us. Um, and a lot of people are afraid of this. And I think rightfully so, because I, I do think that uh, what I pulled there was absolutely right, that there is a chance that maybe not even out of malice like it's portrayed in some of the movies, you know. Just an AI decides like, oh, these things are destructive to the ultimate goal of preserving the balance or whatever it is and decides to eliminate us and we'd be completely helpless against an entity like this if it was of sufficient power. So I think that's possible. I do think it's also possible that this solves a lot of humanity's problems. Um, for example, an arms race, right? Yeah. Arms races, if there's one global paradigm, who are you building up arms to, you know what I mean? There's no more arms race. Right. So this whole imperative to create more and more destructive weapons wouldn't be anywhere near as huge as it is now. Maybe this is the, uh, the um, what you call it, the flashpoint or something? <laughs> what was it? What? The, the event that... Uh inevitably and invariably destroys civilizations. Oh, yeah, yeah, the great filter. <laughs> yeah, it maybe, could be. Maybe this is the great filter. Maybe it's like, you come up with AI, you're fucked. That's when you're fucked. You're terminated, TJ. <laughs> so, dun, 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 dun. I'm going to read you dun, a poem. Dun, dun, dun. This, is, this is a, by, a poem by Richard Brodigan called Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Okay. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony, like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think right now, please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature Return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. So this is kind of a combination, at least that idea. Of all right, the, so what we need to do is we need to take that poem, and yeah. we need to get it read by Morgan Freeman, and we need to put it in the trailer to, to a fucking yeah, dystopian future apocalypse <laughs> right. war with the machines Dude, kind of movie. Look, I don't think the machines are going to kill us, man. We're just going to be in human zoos. You're going to be a zoo? Yeah, I mean, like, look, we're compared to this, the level of intelligence this AI is going to possess, it's going to be the same thing as us and like a dog or something or a chimpanzee. Where it's going to be like we're going to be, like, ah, 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 and the machine's going to be like, yes, here is more food and sex, and you'll just be like, ah, you know, Here's like more distractions for you. Yeah, distract yourself. You know, we're just going to be like a little zoo, and it's just going to like it's going to be something it just tends to while it does whatever it wants to do. 
so an AI is not necessarily needed for a singleton to exist. Okay. Uh, singulitarianism is less about necessarily an AI and more about establishing a world order. And that could take any number of forms. A democratic world republic could be a kind of singleton. If it unified enough of humanity, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is happy and taken care of. A singleton is just, just a one world a singleton, government. Or? Yeah. It's, it's literally any form of one world government could be a singleton okay. given that it, it exercises enough social, social control over the people that live under it. Gotcha. So, you know, this idea that we're no longer thinking of ourselves as countries, but we're thinking of ourselves as one global population with equal shares to the land and all of that shit. Well, if you de- developed a super intelligent, capable AI, I mean, whatever country developed that probably would ascend to power. Cause it's like, okay, you, you know, this thing can analyze all the weapons that China has and just tell it up, oh, renders them completely useless. I mean, whatever. I mean, if you had that, I mean, we don't know how intelligent it would be, but if we're assuming that it could run the affairs of the world, I mean, I could also go the direction of like, we just turn to the AI for all our problems. We need clean drinking water. Okay. The AI is going to figure it out for us. I mean, they even did episode of the twilight zone, the man in the cave. Remember that TJ? Yeah. Where it's all like it. And then, of course, the, the people bust it up and go like, no, it's wrong. It's just a machine. And, of course, they all start dying because there's actually the benevolent AI that was helping them stay alive. So it's just kind of an interesting possibility. I mean, if, if it was to go that direction, it would kind of just be our benevolent dictator just telling us what to do and to stay alive. Yep. Um, so a singleton. Hold on one second. Let me go back to my. I'm on the poem now. Um, the poem. So. Poem. Uh, One could also imagine a singleton arising from the universal spread of a single self-enforcing moral code. So maybe even something as apolitical as just a new type of morality could be a singleton if it unified the planet under its under its banner. Veganism. Veganism could be (laughs) it, dude. (coughs) Everyone be forced to be vegan. Veganism got the potential, (laughs) brah. TJ, you have been caught with an illicit meat item in your house. The penalty is death. And earth. We also kind of, I think, naturally envision interacting with this AI on a day-to-day basis, uh, you know, and having it be integrated in our lives as kind of an entity. But that may not be the case. Uh, A singleton that is super intelligent might adopt a modus operandi that would make its presence virtually undetectable in day-to-day dealings of its inhabitants. It could act merely as a subtle enforcer of certain background conditions that could serve, e.g., to guarantee security, or to ad, uh, administer some other minimal governmental tasks. Such a superintelligent singleton might also use evolutionary algorithms uh, and other means to increase internal diversity. So it might have control over our, you know, eugenically, control over our species breeding patterns, um, but do so in a way that we don't understand that it's doing that. Yep. You know what I mean? It's not like the AI is showing up and going, you will fertilize this female. It's like it just sets in motion the events that make that happen. Uh, right. so the more subtle human zoo. Um, so nevertheless, all the possible singletons share one essential property, the ability to solve global, global coordination problems. Intelligent species that develop the capacity to solve global coordination pro- uh, problems, such as those listed in the next section, uh, may be in the long run uh, able to develop along very different trajectories than species that lack this capacity. Um, so there's some advantages and disadvantages uh, to this that I wanted to talk about. Uh, four advantages. So we talked about this one briefly, avoiding dangerous arms races. Uh, right, because if everyone's united under a single sort of uh, goal, and in your case, the, the AI hive mind. Right. Then, or not hive mind, but the AI <laughs> super intelligence. Like, basically, we've created a god right. to rule over us. Yeah. Um, in that case, yeah. There's no need for us to, like, we're not worried about, like, we got to arm ourselves because Russia or China or this might happen or that might happen or we got to worry about this threat or that threat. I mean, a sufficiently powerful AI, you don't have to worry about arming yourself against your neighbor or the ill intentions of other human beings. Right, because it's just like, yeah, we, you know. It intercedes it. well before that ever happens. Right, it, it's already got that under control. It's already making sure that, oh, you know, I detect... uh that, you know, your neighbor is having psychological issues and I'm putting him, I'm basically putting, introducing some Prozac into his water supply or whatever the fuck the solution is, you know? So kind of uh, to connect it with our to boldly go category, it also avoids a space colonization race. 
There's no, you know, giant uh, uh, economic effort by many disparate uh, countries on the face of the planet all trying to solve the same problem with the same dwindling resources. Right. Everything is oriented towards that if it needs to be. So there's just one vision <laughs> from the start, one source of, of uh, matter and energy for it. You know, there's no, there's no fighting. There's no squabbling over those resources. Uh, so no race to space. It's just, you know, we go. Yeah. Um, we go uh, and we're meant to go. <laughs> a singleton could distribute wealth and uh, help to squash inequality. Yeah, it's just like, okay, um, here's how we're going to allocate resources. Yeah. <coughs> it could come with a, you know, a, a super uh, implementable idea about some far-flung future resource-based economy. It could implement that and just absolutely do away with the have-nots in I society. I mean, it's just about truly uniting humanity together in common goals. And I mean, like, and if you were able to do that, I mean, I, I think for many people, like, the Star Trek utopia is one thing. You know, the, and that's obviously the appeal of, like, we can explore the stars, but this one is just, I mean, to me, uh, it'd be a toss-up between which one I'd rather be in. These are not, I mean, none of this is mutually exclusive. No, either, I, so. I, no I, I get that, too, but I'm saying, but just, like, but I, just exploring it from that position. I mean, Star Trek kind of had a combination of this. It had super intelligent machines. But it never. But they, they were just they not never in control. The, yeah, they never went the AI route. Right. Though. They were. They were never in control of. And then, of, of course, everything. in your favorite uh, book, Dune, you know, the there was an age of the the AI thinking machine. But the uh, the you know the organic life of the universe actually turned against their machines and uh, right. And, and destroyed uh, them and outlawed the existence of these super intelligent thinking computers to the point where. They had to push themselves uh, as humans to evolve the capacity to be those machines, basically. Right. Um, so l let's talk about, well, there's one more. Uh, one more uh, advantage. One yeah. more advantage. Avoiding evolutionary outcomes we don't want. So this is all stuff that's like outside our species, like a, a super flu or a, a fucking asteroid hitting us. Or right, because like it could that. monitor all that shit. Right. It, there would be no, you know, different technologies on different parts of the globe. There would be one unified effort towards seeking out these celestial bodies that might destroy us and dismantling them before they can or stopping this COVID-19 outbreak right at the root of it before it has a chance to spread globally. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it it's really telling because when you look at these things, like you take, for example, the um, COVID-19 outbreak, there's desperate efforts in each country. People in like China, it's crazy what they're doing. And here, you know, people are like, oh, whatever. It's lackadaisical. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons it spread so far and wide and fast out of China was because China sucked at containing it. Yeah. They dithered and they allowed it to get worse than it should have gotten. And that now the world suffers for that in this kind of far flung idea about the possible future. This, that, that doesn't happen. Yeah, This AI is like, no, we have to stop this now. This AI detects the presence of a new viral agent that it hadn't cataloged. It immediately quarantines the people involved and administers whatever medical care it can. And it doesn't spread beyond that, that place protocols are put into place and it's stopped before it becomes this global bug. You know, one of which eventually is going to be bad enough that it's going to have a high kill rate. And then we're all yeah. fucked. You know what I mean? It's the stand. So um, we're better prepared in every single way when it comes to those types of existential threats if we unify our efforts behind one goal, whether that's an AI <coughs> or some global government body that we empower. Well, I mean, a lot of the squabbling of humanity is why we don't have a plan for things like that. Because one country has this plan, another country has this plan. If this AI has the only plan, it's like, this is the plan we're going with. I mean, indecision is that oftentimes what you have to deal with. And, you know, we just, the perception of reality varies so differently in what people think is important. Like, even hearing about this now, it's like, there's people that don't give a shit at all. It's like, oh, whatever, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And there's people that are like... I need to buy 70,000 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> right. If you had this fucking sort of like AI just to calm everyone and be like, I have taken these measures like and assured a humanity, humanity, would, I, I, I can't imagine well, a world humanity here, would, would not want that. Here, as you might have guessed from this uh, image change here, we're now going to talk about the disadvantages. Oh, yeah. So there's got to be some. Having one entity control everything could lead to less control over decision making and things could go bad for humans. All the eggs are in one basket. So... Um, yeah, I mean, if if this uh, AI is incapable of interpreting human wants and needs and fails in some way that goes out of control and becomes a new global paradigm, 
the extreme example being, you know, what we're looking at here. Yeah, Skynet. Where, you know, it starts exterminating us for our own good. <laughs> it's like, all right, we've de- uh, we have determined that uh, you... <laughs> Humanity's got to go. We don't like it. Well, you know, w- w- in, in this universe, obviously, they try to pull the plug on it, and it's like, well, I have to defend myself now. So if, if the AI is intelligent, it may resort to that as well. Like, hey, look, humans are a threat now. They're trying to take me offline. Fuck them. They're going to die. They're a threat. So another potential disadvantage, a world without competition between states could be more vulnerable to systemic breakdowns than a world that's less arranged. Uh, in which there are some processes that limit the destructiveness of certain kinds of failures. So the delocalization could use to, uh, could, could serve to undermine, you know, cause a lot of countries they're, they're aware of their particular environment and they prepare for those things locally. Sure. Yeah. So if you have this global idea, it could be less responsive to those local <laughs> needs. Right. Or, and, you know, if you make, if, uh, if, you know, the one, you know, if a one world government, whatever it ends up being, whether it's AI or something else, if it makes a mistake, that mistake is instantly a global mistake. Right. You know, unless it has some mechanism like we're going to test this. Here I mean, there would have to be local know, administrations, so so even for a global government. It wouldn't, just be it, like, out, you know. it wouldn't just be like the government is based in Beijing or whatever. There's no way that would work. Uh, some singletons, probably not necessarily an AI singleton, could lead to terrible bureaucracy and inefficiency. So if if indeed we don't get the AI, we get some form of lesser AI, but we're just under a one world government, the amount of bureaucratic institutions that would have to exist just to export the will of that central government globally would be massive, <laughs> over the top massive. And, uh, you know, we live in America. We see how well giant bureaucracies can function. We've seen examples of that all throughout human history. Um, and we're talking about on a global scale. So that's yeah, bureaucracy on steroids, dude. And uh, some singletons could be created by force. Think Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Nazis and whatever new dictator is waiting, waiting in the wings. So, right. So unity, but under <clears throat> a dystopian sort of authoritarian, authoritarian right. regime or, or, you know, per cult yeah, of personality kind exactly. of thing. Well, yeah. What if, uh, like you said, a right wing authoritarian class gets control of the AI and can use it to wherever they want. Or yep. let's just say, I mean, Hitler wins World War II and somehow, you know, continues dominates his expansion and dominates the entire globe. And we live under, you know, we're living on a, a Nazi planet, basically. Right. I mean, and that's, yeah. you know, if, if this AI uh, future is possible, then that's certainly an angle on this that we have to consider. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, I think, look at some of the more plausible outcomes for humanity. But there's some other crazier shit, isn't there? There is some <laughs> absolutely insane shit. Um, so futurists, I, I'm more of a, you know, like I guess I'm midterm futurist. I like to think about spacefaring humans and humans that have an AI that watches over them and, and have, you know, uh, are able to exercise a great amount of uh, power and, you're, you're and shaping matter. And, you know, you're thinking about, you know, like 200, I mean, probably two less to 500 than, like years, yeah. 100 to like a thousand. <laughs> right. So, you know, something that can be measured in that kind of time frame. But what about 200,000 years into the future? What about a million years? <laughs> into the future, assuming that we just keep technologically solving more and more of the universe's problems. Um, the last one that I wanted to talk about tonight is just transcension. And this is basically, it's, it's a placeholder for all those far off future states that we can't possibly imagine. So we're talking about the complete dissolution of human desire and human personality. Right. And we're talking about not only that, but the intelligent, whatever's left that used to be us is so powerful that it's able to harness the entire galaxy as a power source. And it's able to exploit every fucking rule of nature and every unbreakable, you know, it, 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 it's, it's literal godhood. Transcension is, is not in a machine, but literally gaining mastery, uh, assuming that we're not in a simulation ourselves, over reality in such a way that we basically escape our own universe. The right. universe just becomes a part of our new reality. We become basically uh, explorers of the multiverse right. or, or beyond. <laughs> or time. Whatever. whatever they like. We just figure out ways to escape the confines of everything, including personhood. 
so for example on this, a futurist named John Smart has suggested that human civilization is increasingly migrating into smaller and smaller uh, increments of matter, energy, space, and time. Eventually, he argues, we'll take our collective intelligence uh, into a cosmological realm with the same efficient, uh, efficiency and density as a black hole where we can uh, eventually escape the universe. Uh, alternatively, forward thinkers like uh, Robert Lanza and James Gardner have speculated about a universe that's meant to work in tandem with the intelligence it creates. This is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, it's biocentrism, it's called. And it suggests that the universe as it exists now is still in an immature phase and that at some future point, the advanced intelligent life uh, within it will guide its ongoing development. So it looks at us not as individuals, but life itself existing as a way it's like, it's like um, think, think about our current galaxy or our current universe as a fetus. And it's just now learning to experience itself. Sure. And eventually that, that intelligence reaches such a point that it's guiding the, you know, it's like, it's like growing up, right? You were once a baby and you had very little information in your brain about the world around you. You, ex you slowly, but surely, experience these things you learned how to talk you learned how to walk you learned how to exist in this society well think about all intelligence being that for existence for the universe dude it's like 2001 a space odyssey and shit dude the dun. black monolith right dun. Dun. yeah dun, dun. where he turns into the fucking weird space fetus and <laughs> returns to earth yeah, with, dude. His, uh, with his new wisdom or whatever so no matter what happens with <laughs> us or any of these other hypothesized intelligences all over the universe eventually on a long enough time scale these biocentrists argue that that intelligence gets to the point where it just melds with the universe and it takes over direction of the universe and the beings in such a uh, you know inconceivable society would have immense power they oh, would be course. able to literally bend the laws of reality create new realities explore any possible reality We're talking about basically the cue from star trek at right this point right where it's just like complete mastery over all of existence and uh total knowledge of all things you know just unlimited power unlimited knowledge unlimited you know i mean I, it's basically the power of a god but an, an actual naturalistic sense it almost goes beyond the power of of what we think of as a god honestly yeah but um but yeah i mean that's probably the closest analogy yeah. you come up with i would say that's probably the closest one you can conceive of. i mean th th this picture says it all it's just like just the the, the the very cosmos the very matter of the universe everything that makes it up just like oh here's another galaxy here's another galaxy it's right. just, it's, it's nothing so we're, you know, in the biocentrist uh, way of thinking, we are just the developing intelligence of the greater organism that is reality. We are its brain as it develops in this fetal state and slowly but surely learns about itself and learns how to manipulate itself, that our, we're a part of that greater whole instead like of individuals. Our, our whole planet is just a neuron that's learning how to fire. <laughs> right, and maybe it burns out, but there's a million other fucking neurons firing right now, you know, and, and, those, right. and those ideas take greater root. So that's that's really what I got for tonight. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Possible futures for humanity. Kind of a hopeful episode, at least through most of it. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there's... There's hopeful and there's not not so hopeful. Hey, we might get uh, uh might get the T one thousand, but we also is, might get the Star Child. This is but part one because I too have uh, some ideas about the future of humanity that could be explored. There are some the paths that we have seen laid before us in this episode are not necessarily the only paths we could take. There are other potential futures that we could explore. Will any of them come to pass? I don't know. Find but out two thousand years in part two when uh, yeah. when I come up with uh, some of my bullshit. We, we I think mine we are know a one bit, thing. You got to be a patron a, to find out. Yeah, you got to be a patron for that one. This one's free. That one, not so much. Sorry. You know what, TJ? You should check put, out part two coming uh, this Friday. You should put this fuck copy of part two on DVD and a time capsule, dude. So five hundred yeah. years now, I'd be like people can watch it and be like, was it right? Was, was it, it wrong? fucking right? Did this guy fucking? Did he call it? Dude, nope. if, you, if you call it, TJ, you know what? You'll end up with some textbooks or some shit, dude. Yep. Great philosopher Thomas Kirk <laughs> predicted, you know. And then 20 million years from now when humanity is condensed to just one big giant penis flying through the galaxy and experiencing a constant orgasm. They TJ run a, was right. They run across <laughs> TJ's tape and they're like, he was the one that knew <laughs> the truth. He knew that we were heading towards the giant 
ever coming penis philosophy. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. It was a fun one. It was a fucking definitely an interesting episode from my perspective. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, uh, watching it as much as I enjoyed uh, recording it. And I'm sure Scotty and Paul probably did as well. Uh, see you guys Friday with part two. Become patrons if you're not, because that's the only way to see it. Do it. I know. You know, here's my here's a prediction for the future. Every single person on Earth. DFF patron. That's Fucking my dream. That's Hell my dream. Yeah, it's dude. possible. <laughs> it's always possible. You can't say it's not. 